This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on Him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other created thing, is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study in God's word this morning, let's bow our heads together and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we are reminded that all that we have and all that we are comes from you, and it is due to your great grace blessings that we live in such a time in which we do and in such a nation in which we live that we have the magnificent blessings of freedom that we have. Father, it's too easy for us to take these freedoms for granted, to forget that these freedoms have been purchased for us upon the field of battle. And even today, there are many men and women serving in uniform in areas of the world where they daily go in harm's way, willing to make the ultimate sacrifice that we might have freedom, and that our freedoms and that this nation founded under the Constitution would continue under the Constitution as a nation of law, for only in law is there true freedom as a nation of laws. Father, we thank you for your word that opens up our minds to truth, enlightens us to the realities of your, your plan, your purpose, and that we may truly come to understand the transcendental truths that are to influence our lives and our thinking, that which you have revealed in your word, and that truly the only freedom comes when we know your word, and it is that truth that makes us free. Now, Father, we pray today that as we study your word, that God the Holy Spirit would make clear to us what your word teaches, and that we may come to a greater understanding of the many manifold freedoms that we have. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. Memorial Day was originally called Decoration Day. And it was designed and is designed as a day of remembrance for those who have died in our nation's service. Often people today do not observe Memorial Day as it has been observed in the past. And often they think that it is, and get it confused with Veterans Day, which is a day in which we honor those who have served our nation. Memorial Day is a time, though, for us to focus upon those who made that ultimate sacrifice because it is upon their death that we have the freedoms that we have. Last week when I went to Washington, D.C. for the APAC conference, I also took time on Saturday morning to go out to Arlington National Cemetery. remember some years ago when I had the opportunity to go to uh, D.C. for the Memorial Day conference. I used to really enjoy going out on Monday with my friend Dan Ingram, And we would, of course, begin at the Confederate Memorial, and then we would walk through the the cemetery. We would look at some of the more significant uh, graves that are there, but then just take the time to walk through those fields of headstones and to recognize, first of all, that not everyone buried there, of course, gave their life uh, for their country, but they all served. And many of them did give their life Uh, for their country, and many of them did die in combat. And we reflect upon them at Memorial Day. The picture that you see is a picture taken uh, not too far from the Pentagon. The building that you barely see the roof of, I think, is the Navy Annex. And the memorial that you see there is the Air Force Memorial. Some of you may not be familiar with it. I think this just uh, was put up a few years ago. And uh, it's a great reminder to us as you 
walk through any veteran cemetery, but I think especially uh, the cemetery at, uh, at Arlington, to just reflect upon the fact that, that what we have, everything we have, is due to the fact that there are men and women who, from the very beginning of this nation, were willing to sacrifice. As the uh, signers of the Declaration of Independence stated, they were willing to pledge their lives and their fortunes that we might be free. And that's just such a tremendous act of selflessness that they would die, be willing to die, so that we could have freedom. Memorial Day, originally called, as I said, originally called Decoration Day, uh, there are those who believe it began in the South. There's evidence that during the uh, war uh, between the states, the war we often call the War of Northern Aggression, that during that war, uh, widows, ladies in the South, began to decorate the graves of those who had fallen in battle. But there are also, there's also evidence that this began in the North as well, and though there's some debate, some controversy as to how this got started, it's most likely that uh, due to the tremendous loss of life during that conflict, that it was a time when uh, many places uh, began to do this. And so it was not until... Uh, this uh, century, we began to develop it uh, or observe it on the last Monday of, uh, of May. The official proclamation, which began the observance of Memorial Day, began on the 5th of May in 1868, when General John Logan, who was the national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, gave General Order No. 11 uh, for the observance of Memorial Day. And on 30, the 30th of May, 1868, Flowers were placed on the graves of both Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, for many years, the South, some states in the South, observed Memorial Day at different times. Texas, for many years, observed uh, Memorial Day or Decoration Day on January the 19th. But then, as I said, in the uh, 1960s, then Memorial Day was moved from May 30th to the last Monday in May. Yesterday, or the day before, an editorial appeared in the Wall Street Journal, written by James D. Hornfisher. It was entitled, The Things They Buried. I just want to read a few paragraphs from that editorial, which are particularly poignant. He writes in his editorial of the times that he has spent as a historian uh, uh, talking to and recording the memories of World War II veterans, a generation that is quickly passing off the scene. And once they pass off the scene, all we will have are these recordings, all we will have is the, these direct observations. And he talks about uh, a couple of different people, several different people in the article. I'll just read a couple of them. He speaks of one Robert Graff. He says, Robert Graff, another reluctant witness, was a young officer on the light cruiser USS Atlanta when it was sunk in action off Guadalcanal on November 13, 1942. Mr. Graff had never spoken of his experiences outside of his family. He had been urged into a silence of 65 years by the trauma of Atlanta's destruction, which claimed a much-beloved commander, Rear Admiral Norman Scott, along with most everyone else on the bridge where Mr. Graff was stationed. In 2007, referred by one of his friends, I called Mr. Graff and talked to him about the battle. Not long afterward, I visited him in his home in Far Hills, New Jersey, where he spoke in great detail about his wartime memories, an opening up of experience that seemed to be cathartic for him. Later that year, he appeared at a symposium at the National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas. By the way, if you've never been there, I encourage you to go. It is, when I first went and it was just in the old Nimitz Hotel, I thought it was a great museum, but it has gone through several expansions in the last 20 years, and it is just a fabulous, fabulous uh, museum. The National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas. Before an audience of several hundred, he saluted his lost shipmates and recited the eulogy he had delivered on a 1998 trip to the waters above his sunken ship off Guadalcanal. Those of us on deck today have come across the half the world to be near to you in this anointed spot. 
On one horizon today, sharp, verdant peaks of Guadalcanal pierce the sky. From the water surrounding us, millions of javelins, reflected rays of the sun, blind us with your memory and pierce our hearts. Later in the article, Horn Fisher writes of another hero. He says the USS Atlanta was part of a 13-ship task force led by a revered naval hero, Rear Admiral Daniel J. Callahan. His flagship, the USS San Francisco, was heavily hit in that battle. One of the last veterans still alive who witnessed Callahan's words and actions is Eugene Tarrant, a black cook who who worked virtually invisibly in the San Francisco's wardroom. As Mr. Tarrant told me in a 2007 interview, he heard through a dumbwaiter door to the galley Callahan speaking in low, grave tones about the battle plan he would use that night off Guadalcanal. The task force's prospects against the powerful enemy squadron sounded grim, and Mr. Tarrant ventured to ask Callahan whether the coming fight really was, as the Admiral had said, suicide. Yes, it may be that, replied Callahan, who would die in the action. But we're going in. Callahan was awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously for his actions that day. Last week, as I was at the um, National Cemetery, I also had an opportunity to go to the grave of my uncle. You remember he died last year and was buried in December, and they have now put up his, his headstone there at... Um, at Arlington National Cemetery. I found out that he uh, gave an interview, an oral interview, to the University of North Texas, which has conducted a huge amount of interviews of World War II veterans. And you can make some of those available to you uh, through their website. And I purchased the transcript of his, uh, basically, his story of World War II, which is just fascinating because he uh, entered into the service at the very beginning in uh, 1940, and served throughout the war as well as a number of other number of other exploits. When we observe Memorial Day, one of the things that we need to think about is the whole concept of freedom. Freedom is a word that is often used by politicians and community leaders, often repeated at speeches again and again at times like Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and, and Veterans Day. But freedom is something, a concept that is, I think, often misunderstood today. People often think that freedom means that they're free to do whatever they want to do. Freedom, they think, is something that uh, just applies to their own unrestrained will. But what we learn when we study the history of the founding of this nation is that freedom was viewed as freedom from the external controls and tyranny of government so that it is not freedom to do what we want to do, but freedom from the restraints of government to be the best that we can be to pursue whatever it is that we desire to do without destroying the freedom of others. We learn from our study of the war for independence that freedom is never free. Each generation has to earn its own right to be free because there are always enemies, both internal and external, who seek to destroy our freedom. When we think about freedom, we must recognize that freedom ultimately is a mindset. It's a mentality, a mental attitude. Freedom means, above all, personal responsibility for one's decisions and one's actions. It means that we take the responsibility for success or failure in our own lives. We're responsible for our own life, for our own decisions, We are not dependent upon the government or someone else to provide for us or to take care of us. Our life is what we make of it. Freedom means not blaming others for our failures, and it also means not necessarily taking the credit for our own success. Freedom means to respect the freedom of others to be different, to disagree, to believe and espouse things that perhaps offend us. Freedom means that we don't try to limit others' freedoms for our own comfort. We must recognize that freedom and equality are not the same. Freedom and equality are mutually exclusive. 
Equality focuses on results. Freedom focuses on opportunity. Freedom means that we don't try to limit others' freedom and opportunities for success just so others' failures can be ameliorated. Freedom means the opportunity to do what we can with whatever God has given us. Equality seeks to limit that so that everybody has the same results. Freedom focuses on personal responsibility. Equality focuses on government responsibility and the responsibilities of others. Freedom focuses on potential and encourages initiative and risk. Equality attempts to guarantee consequences and discourages initiative and risk. It is for our freedom that hundreds of thousands have died. Not They did not die that they could guarantee the equality of results, but they died that we would have equality under the law, the freedom for each one to pursue excellence on the basis of their own volition, the freedom to be unhindered by tyranny and unhindered by the control of government. While political freedom and civil freedom is the best that we can hope for in this life, ultimately it's not the real freedom. Real freedom is spiritual. Real freedom has to do not with civil law or political institutions, but is a mindset, but is a reality that comes only in terms of our relationship with God. Real spiritual freedom comes only when we are free from the tyranny of our own sin nature and free from the penalty of sin, which is, our, which is spiritual death. As we saw and heard in the reading of Scripture today in John 8, the Bible teaches that there's only one way to realize true freedom, and that is a freedom that was purchased by death. The ultimate memorial is, of course, at Golgotha, where the Lord Jesus Christ died to purchase our freedom. As the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, or chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. This morning we're going to look at that topic of freedom in the passage we're studying in Colossians. So open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. We've been studying in this passage Paul's prayer. For the Colossian believers, his prayer of, for their spiritual growth, his prayer that they would advance in the power that God has given them through the Holy Spirit, and that that pursuit would be based upon knowledge. As Jesus said in John 8, it is through the knowledge of truth that we have true freedom. But that truth is not a truth found in a philosophy textbook. It's not a truth found in a college classroom but it is truth that is embedded in the revealed Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. In the first four verses of this section, verses 9 through 12, Paul focuses on what is needed to walk worthy, what is needed to have a full spiritual life, to be filled with the knowledge of His will, that to walk worthy of the Lord, to be strengthened with all might and giving thanks to the Father. This is verse 12, where we, which we studied in the last lesson. There Paul uses a purpose participle to give thanks to the Lord who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. I want you to note in terms of this context that the focal point of verse 12 is future, that we are giving thanks now to the Father who's qualified us for a future reality, and that is at some time in the future to partake of the inheritance that has been set aside for us. So the context is future. The context orients us not to today, but to something in the future. Further, those who have trusted in Christ are identified as those in the light. This is going to be contrasted with the power of darkness 
that we see in verse 13. Now, verse 13, as you look at this in, if you look at the New King James translation, for example, it sets this apart as an independent sentence. It is not independent in the Greek. It's a relative clause that as the apostle has focused our attention upon the Father, he now identifies who this is. He wants, he's going to say something about the Father and then from there talk about the Son. So he uses a um, relative participle here to express who God is. It is He, that is, who God, that God the Father that is, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. There are six key words or phrases in these two verses. The phrase delivered, what does that mean? What does it mean, the power of darkness? In what sense have we been conveyed from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love? Uh, What exactly does that mean, the kingdom of the Son of His love? And then in verse 14, the two concepts that are interconnected redemption, and forgiveness of sins. So when we begin, we see that it begins with this uh, participle, this relative participle, God who has delivered us from the power of darkness. The word here that is translated delivered is a word that is a synonym that is often used in relation to spiritual salvation. It's the Greek word ruamai, it's, I want you to notice that it's in the aorist tense, which here just simply summarizes, summarizes a past event. Greek verbs are kind of odd, a little different from English. We just think of verbs as just in terms of time, past, present, future. In Greek, there's two, as, two, two components to understand a verb. One is called aspect, which indicates something that is either summarized or it's continuous or it's completed. And that's the focus here is something that is, that is just summarized. And in the indicative mood, it indicates that this is in, also in past time. So this is something that has already transpired. Paul is talking, uses the first person plural us. So he is applying this both to himself as well as to his audience. This took place at the time that they trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. It is at that time that one of the many things that God does for us uh, transpires. We shift our authority. We are born under the authority of the domain of darkness, and we are shifted into a different authority identified here as the kingdom of his love. So this first verb here, uh, ruamai, indicates the idea of being delivered from something, rescued from something, preserved or saved. So we could translate this any number of ways to convey that, that he is the one who's delivered us, he's the one who's rescued us, he's the one who's preserved us from this power of darkness. Now that next phrase that we want to examine is the phrase power of darkness. What exactly does that describe? It uh, We've delivered from this power, and it's important to note these prepositions The from here in the Greek indicates the removal, uh, being removed from being under a power. This is one of the categories of the use of this uh, preposition. So we're moved, we're transferred, we're shifted from being under one authority system to being in in another type of authority. The terms of uh, of the authority of darkness or the power of darkness doesn't indicate that's a kingdom. Uh, It's not exactly a one-to-one uh, contrast here. We're delivered from, or out from under a certain dominion. Uh, exousia is also, also translated dominion or power or authority here. The authority of darkness. And the concept of darkness is often used in Scripture to describe the world that is in rebellion against the light of God's Word. There's a couple of different ways in which this metaphor of light and darkness are used. Uh, One way in which light is used is in relation to God's holiness, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all, 1 John says. And that relates to his perfect righteousness, 
that there is no sin in him. There is no evil in him. He is absolute, pure righteousness. Another way in which light and darkness are used is in relation to revelation, that when God's truth is revealed to us, it is enlightening. We are in the light. Uh, And then, in contrast, there is darkness. So there is this this metaphor that's used scripturally to refer to the domain of Satan as the domain of darkness, the authority of darkness, versus God's domain, which is the domain of light. This is positional, and it has to do with revelation in this metaphor, in this usage, not in terms of righteousness or justice. The The passage that is most close to this is one that was articulated by the Apostle Paul as well in Acts 26, 18, where we're talking about God, he says, to open their eyes, praying to open their eyes, that is the eyes of the unsaved, in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Here the word ecstasy is used of both God and Satan, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, notice this, that in this shift, that the power of Satan relates to his domain, and then God has his domain or his realm of authority. And that for a shift to take place in this statement, which is from the Lord Jesus Christ to the Apostle Paul, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Note how closely this relates to what the Apostle says here in verse Uh, 14, that in Christ we have redemption, uh, the forgiveness of sins, and that this then provides us with an inheritance, and that inheritance is yet future. So we see a couple of things here. We see that there's a contrast between two domains. We see that one domain has a future orientation related to inheritance, and that uh, being transferred from one to the other is related to faith in Christ. We see a similar idea in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, the Apostle Paul is talking about the warfare, the invisible warfare that Christians are in, in terms of the greater battle that has occurred between Satan, that is the devil, and God the Father. In eternity past, this rebellion occurred when Satan, or Lucifer as he was called at that time, Uh, was desired to be like God, to have the power of God, and to receive all of the praise and adulation and worship that was uh, going to God. And so his fall began this this cosmic conflict wherein uh, wherein Satan uh, enticed a third of the angels to follow him, and then eventually God, in a demonstration of his grace and love, created the present earth and the human race within it in order to demonstrate his grace and love uh, through human history. So Paul reflects upon that and this cosmic conflict and says in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. The word for powers there is exousia, the same idea of authority. And so the... Uh, Apostle recognizes that we are engaged in this war against these forces of evil who have various ranks and various positions. He identifies them in uh, Ephesians 6.12 as principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this age. They are spiritual, uh, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. They are not earthly. They are not flesh and blood. It belongs to the realm of the fallen angels, those who have rebelled against God. In Ephesians 2, verse 2, Paul also referenced this in talking to the Ephesians and in terms of their former life before they were saved. He refers to this as a life that was empowered and influenced by Satan through the mentality or the thinking of the world. He says this was the course in which you once walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince and the power of the air, there's a title for Satan. He is in authority over this earth during this time. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. 2 Corinthians 4.4 also refers to him 
as, in terms of his power that he is the God of this age. And as such, he blinds the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Once again, we see the contrast between darkness, being blinded, and the light of the gospel, which illuminates our minds, our souls, what Paul says, the illumination of our hearts, so that we understand the truth of God's word. John chapter 12, verse 31, tells us that the ruler of this world has been cast out. His judgment, although he has not been removed from a position of influence, his authority has been uh, legally fractured and ended by uh, the cross. John 12, 31. Now is this judgment of this world, now the ruler of this world will be cast out in reference to what would take place on the cross. Now back to Colossians 1.13 we read that God the Father delivered us from the power or the authority of darkness and he conveyed us, that's the New King James translation, into the kingdom of his son. Now the word translated conveyed is the word uh, methistemi and it indicates removing somebody from one place to another. It refers to some sort of change or turning aside or causing a shift or change of position. And this is a positional reality as opposed to experiential reality. And by that I mean that uh, when we understand Satan's kingdom, we realize that even though we are transferred under the authority of God, we still, we still sin. There is a transfer of authority position from the dominion of darkness, the authority of darkness, to the kingdom of light. Now when we think about Satan's kingdom, just a minute, there are a couple of characteristics to re be reminded of. First of all, it's a kingdom that is characterized by darkness rather than light. Darkness and light have an absolute reference point, and that is the revelation of God and that absolute truth. Second characteristic of Satan's kingdom is deception. Revelation 13, 14, as well as the passage we read earlier in John chapter 8, says that Satan is a liar. John 8, Jesus said Satan is a liar and the father of lies. In Ephesians 2, 2, the kingdom of Satan is characterized by disobedience to God. Therefore, and this is an important point to get to understand what's happening in this passage, therefore we have to understand that Though, because Christians still sin, because we still lie, because we're still deceptive, because we still commit the whole range of sins, then what this, these passages talk about when it talks about being transferred from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of light is a positional reality, not an experiential reality. We haven't experienced that yet in terms of being completely removed from the influence of the dominion of darkness, it's just that Satan no longer has authority over us. Now, we may, in terms of making certain decisions, may still decide to live as if we're in that kingdom, but we don't. Think of it this way. Think of being born in, let's say, Soviet Russia, and you grow up under all of the fear and all of the totalitarian controls of a, uh, of a Marxist state. And somehow you're able to get out and you come to the United States. And here you have freedom. Here there's the rule of law. And you have opportunity. Yet every now and then, because of the way you were raised living over there in the Soviet Union, you all of a sudden have an attack of fear. You have a little panic attack, a little anxiety attack that somebody's watching you, that there are listening devices in your room or in your house. And then you stop, you realize, no, I can't live like that. I'm no longer a citizen of, of the Soviet Union. I've been transferred to a new authority, a new dominion, and I don't live like I did when I was under that old authority. This is the focal point of Scripture. It is not that we are now in the kingdom, because the kingdom, is, as we'll see, is yet future, but that we are under the authority of, of the one who will be the king in that kingdom. The next word that we need to understand in this verse is this phrase, kingdom. 
the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now, when we look at this phrase, we need to ask the question, what is this kingdom? Those of you who've been with me on Tuesday nights in our study of Acts know that this is an incredibly significant concept and doctrine in the book of Acts, and one that I've been taking some time with the last uh, two or three lessons in Acts, trying to understand just what this concept uh, means and how are we to understand kingdom. Is this a, the, a reference to the universal authority of God, or is this a reference to the literal, physical, messianic kingdom that God promised in the Old Testament uh, to Israel? Or is it something else? Is it some form of spiritual kingdom today where Jesus is ruling in the hearts of those who have believed in him? Now, that last phrase is one that you will often hear from those who don't have a sound view of Scripture. And unfortunately, that idea of a spiritual kingdom is one that has influenced a number of different people. Now, this idea of a spiritual kingdom, that somehow we're in one form of the kingdom... And its full expression is sometime in the future as picked up a technical theological phrase called already and not yet. There's a number of people who uh, bought into this. It's influenced, uh, uh, it's been influential in a premillennial but not dispensational form of theology. It's been influential in the writings of people like N.T. Wright, who is an Anglican theologian who uh, believes that most prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70, that when Jesus predicted his coming, uh, N.T. Wright, along with other preterists, say that Jesus came in the clouds of judgment when Israel was defeated and removed from the land in AD 70. I bring that up because there are people who have been, and pastors who have been somewhat affiliated with us in the past, who have departed from a sound uh, dispensational premillennial view of theology, and they are now off on their own. And there are folks in this congregation who are in congregation, there are people who listen, who have family members, who are in that some of those congregations. And in fact, one of the verses I'm about to mention is one uh, that was uh, brought up to me um, uh, just recently as one that has been emphasized in that particular way of teaching. Now, we must understand, as I pointed out on Tuesday nights, that there are two ways in which this word kingdom or God's authority to rule over history is mentioned in Scripture. One is the idea of a universal sovereign kingdom. The psalmist talks about the fact that God rules forever and ever. There never was a time when he did not rule. This applies to his sovereign creator uh, position and authority, that he is the one who rules over everything he has created, and he always has. He always has that authority. But that is not the way that we are talking about kingdom in this particular verse. There's another way in which kingdom has been used, and writers refer to this as the theocratic kingdom, which has to do with God's rule on the earth. Uh, Some have used the term mediatorial kingdom. There's not a set terminology uh, for this. So we put up a timeline here for human history, and the the first form of the theocratic kingdom that we saw in history was when God is ruling through Adam and Eve, as those created in his image and likeness, uh, when they are in the garden before the fall, God is ruling through Adam and Eve as his uh, proxies, as his vicegerent to rule over creation. That was the first form of the theocratic kingdom. And when God's presence left the earth, then that theocratic kingdom was put on hold. It comes back in another form at Mount Sinai when God has called out a special people for himself, the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he has freed them from slavery in Egypt. Then at Mount Sinai, he gave them a law. In order to have a kingdom, you have to have a king, you have to have a domain over which to rule, and you have to have the exercise of that dominion. That exercise was to come for Israel through the theocracy of Israel at the beginning of of their freedom from Egypt when they would be ruled by God through the the priests and through his word and through the Mosaic law. That kingdom ended in A.D. 70, and Jesus predicted in Matthew 13 that there would be a 
that, he, that there would be an interim period. He called it the mysteries of the kingdom, previously unrevealed truth about the kingdom, but that that kingdom would eventually come, the kingdom God had promised to David, the kingdom he had promised through Isaiah and Jeremiah and the prophets would come to Israel, and this would be the future messianic kingdom, which we refer to as the millennial kingdom, meaning a thousand years. And after that kingdom ends, then we have the eternal theocratic kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, one of many passages I covered a couple of weeks ago in Acts would be Je- Jeremiah 23, 3 through 6, which speaks about a future literal kingdom where God said to Israel, But I will in the future, after this judgment time, after this scattering, I will gather or regather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and they shall increase. And I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king, and reign, and uh, a king shall reign and prosper. This is the establishment of a literal kingdom. And execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. When we talk about this, just to give you a little graphic understanding here, there's three ways that uh, theologians have viewed the coming of the Lord in relation to that future kingdom. One is post-millennialism. This is the idea that Jesus comes back after the kingdom. The kingdom gradually comes in during the church age, and at the end of which Jesus will come back, uh, believers will be taken to be with him, and he will then immediately come to the earth, and then you will have all the end-time judgments and move into eternity. That is the post-millennial position. But we hold to a different position, a position called premillennialism, which means Jesus returns before the millennium. We're now in the present church age. That church age began on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33. It will be followed by a time period known as Daniel's 70th week or the tribulation, after which Jesus will return to the earth. Of course, we know the rapture occurs before the tribulation. I'm not focusing on the timing of the rapture here, just the kingdom. Jesus returns before the kingdom, establishes the kingdom where he rules and reigns on the earth from the throne of David in Jerusalem for a thousand years, and then we go into eternity. Now, the view that is very popular in many Christian circles is a view called amillennialism, which means uh, not a literal millennium. The church age is viewed as the messianic kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom where Jesus rules in the hearts of his followers. So that a thousand is not taken literally, but just as a full number. In their view, Jesus will come at, uh, will then come at, see, all millennialists in recent years have frequently become post-mill. There's a lot of similarity. Uh, Jesus will come at the end of the church age, and then he will have, then we'll have all the judgments and go into eternity. That is the amillennial view of, of the kingdom. Now, when we look at Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, we are, if I can find my arrow again, come on arrow, there we go. We look at Colossians 1, 13. Let me put it back up here on the screen for you. Look at Colossians 1, 13. That we're conveyed or transferred from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light. This is one of two verses that people will go to and say, see, we're in a present form of the kingdom. This verse proves it, and so does Romans 14, 17. Now, Romans 14, 17 states, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The verb that is used there is a present tense verb. The kingdom of God is not. And so there are those who go to this verse and say, see... This shows it is a present form of the kingdom. However, the context of Romans 14 is better understood as a future than a present. In the present life, no one can deny the importance of food and drink. But in the future, in the future kingdom, this will not be significant because we will be in our immortal bodies. 
So I know some of you are real foodies, and food and drink is a, one of the top three priorities in your life. If you know me, you know that's true for me as well. Um, nothing better than an excellent meal. But food is not going to be an issue for us in the millennial kingdom. So when Paul writes in Romans 14, 17 that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, that's not something that applies to this age right now. He's talking about the future. Now he uses a present tense verb, but just like the aorist tense or past tense form that's used here in Colossians 1.13, these two verb forms are frequently used in language with a future sense. They're called a futuristic use of the present, a futuristic use of the aorist, or even a perfect tense. And the reason is that the writer is so confident of a future reality that he speaks of it as already in existence. We can go to a couple of passages that emphasize this. For example, Hebrews 12, 22, and 23 says, But you have come to Mount Zion. Notice that. You have come. It's actually a perfect tense, completed. You have come to Mount Zion. Have we? No, we haven't. That's future. But it is spoken of because we're saved. It's a completed transaction. It will necessarily take place in the future. But because the transaction occurred in relation to our salvation, our future destiny is certain. So the writer speaks of it as having happened in the past, but it is truly in the future. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. See, what he describes there is future to us. But he speaks of it as having already taken place because its future reality is so certain. Another verse familiar to some of you is Romans 8, verse 30. Notice the tense of this language. Moreover, whom he predestined, past tense, aorist tense, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Glorification is future, but... The reality that occurs at salvation is such that the future is so certain that it can be spoken of in the past tense. And so there are many times that the Apostle Paul speaks of a future event, either in the present or as as having already taken place because of its certainty. Now, as I pointed out at the beginning, when we look at the context of verse 12 here, we see the emphasis Uh, in verse 12, of giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be, future sense, partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That inheritance, as I pointed out last time, is related to our position where we will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the context of Colossians 1.13 is a future context. So the kingdom here is not a reference to a present kingdom, but to our preparation now for that future destiny in the kingdom. It is, uh, to use a fancy word, it's what grammarians call a proleptic use of the, of the aorist tense. It really refers to something future, but it's actually spoken of as having taken place uh, in the past. When we compare other passages in Paul, we realize that with the exception of these two verses, the verse in, in um Colossians 1.13 and the verse in uh, Romans 14.17. These are the only two places where Paul speaks of the kingdom in a present sense. In other passages, it's always future. So when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we understand the kingdom is a future event. In 2 Timothy 4.1, Paul said to Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. It is future. 2 Timothy 4, 18, And the Lord will deliver me uh, from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Then in 2 Peter 1, 11, Peter says, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now what's interesting about those two verses, the last two verses I just read, 2 Timothy 4, 18, and 2 Peter 1, 11, is we have this same preposition, E-I-S, ace, 
in those passages in reference to the kingdom. That preposition indicates the direction or goal or ultimate fulfillment of something. So that when we look at uh, this statement that God has transferred us into the kingdom of His Son, it has a sense of a goal or direction. It's not something that is now, but something that is our, our destiny, that which is in the future. So we see three things that tell us that this passage must refer to a future kingdom. First of all, the context is speaking of a future event, the reception of our inheritance and rewards. Second, the complete and final deliverance from darkness and the domain of darkness, which is Satan's domain, does not occur until Satan is finally and ultimately destroyed. And then third, uh, we must also understand that the word ace here is a word that indicates a future direction or a future uh, goal or place or destiny. So God the Father has delivered us in the past when we trusted in Christ as Savior. At that point, we're transferred from the authority or domain of the kingdom of this earth, His rule over the earth, and we are transferred into a new kingdom. And that kingdom will come. But we're in the stage where we're being prepared for that kingdom, and that is our future destiny. And when we're transferred from the authority of Satan, We are removed from the tyranny of the sin nature. We're removed from the tyranny of Satan into a place where we have true freedom. We have freedom because Christ died for our sins. As Paul says in Galatians 5, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And the only way that we can experience real freedom is when we make the Word of God the authority in our thinking and the framework for all of our thought Because as Jesus said, it is only when we know the truth that the truth will set us free. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things this morning. To reflect upon freedom. To reflect upon the civil freedom that we have in this nation. That is based upon the fact that there are hundreds of thousands who have died in order to give us this freedom and to preserve this freedom. But ultimately, real freedom is not a matter of civil or political freedom. It is a matter of spiritual freedom. This was something that the Pharisees of old failed to understand as they were still under the tyranny of sin, they were under the dominion of Rome, and they were under the tyranny of their own legalistic uh, system of works. And because of that, they failed to understand what Jesus was talking about, that only by trusting in him could that ultimate tyranny of sin be broken and real freedom be pursued. And even if we're living under political or civil tyranny, we can still have real freedom in our soul because of our relationship to you. So, Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning who has never trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, someone who has never recognized that they can never do anything to overcome the sin in our lives that to somehow make us acceptable to you, The only one who can do that is Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross paid the penalty for sin that we might have everlasting life. All you need to do right now, right where you sit, is simply believe that Jesus died for you. At that instant, God in his omniscience understands what's going on in your mind and what you're thinking. He knows what you're trusting in, and at that instant, you become saved. At that instant, you're transferred from the authority of darkness to the kingdom of His, uh, the Son of his love. And it is that instant that you receive eternal life, which can never be taken from you. Now, Father, we pray that you would help us to understand the things that we have studied today and that God the Holy Spirit will help us apply them consistently in our own lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.